The Second Anglo-Afghan War was fought between the United Kingdom and Afghanistan from 1878 to 1880, when the nation was ruled by Shah Ali Khan of the Barakzai dynasty, the son of former, Amir Dust Muhammad Khan. This was the second time British India invaded Afghanistan. The war ended in a manner, after attaining all the British geopolitical objectives. Most of the British and Indian soldiers withdrew from Afghanistan. The Afghans were permitted to maintain internal sovereignty, but they had to cede control of their nation's foreign relations to the British. After tension between Russia and Britain in Europe ended with the June 1878 Congress of Berlin, Russia turned its attention to Central Asia. That same summer, Russia sent an uninvited diplomatic mission to Kabul. Sher Ali Khan the Emir of Afghanistan, tried unsuccessfully to keep them out. Russian envoys arrived in Kabul on the 22nd of July 1878, and on 14 August, the British demanded that, Sher Ali accept a British mission too. The Emir not only refused to receive a British mission, under Neville Bowles Chamberlain, but threatened to stop it if it were dispatched. Lord Lytton, the Viceroy, ordered a diplomatic mission to set out for Kabul in September 1878, but the mission was turned back as it approached the eastern entrance of the Khyber Pass, triggering the Second Anglo-Afghan War. A British force of about 40,000 fighting men, mostly British and Indians, was distributed into military columns which penetrated Afghanistan at three different points. An alarmed Shah Ali attempted to appeal in person to the Russian Tsar for assistance, but unable to do so, he returned to Mazar-i Sharif, where he died on 21 February 1879. The Battle of Ali Masjid, which took place on the 21st of November 1878, was the opening battle in the Second Anglo-Afghan War between the British forces, under Lieutenant General Sir Samuel James Brown, and the Afghan tribesmen, under Ghulam Haider Khan. The perceived offence of an Afghan general's refusal to allow a British envoy entrance to the country was used as an excuse to attack the fortress of Ali Masjid, as the opening battle in the war. Despite numerous setbacks, 
including half the troops getting lost or delayed and missing the battle entirely, the British were lucky that the Afghans abandoned their position overnight. The British victory meant that the northern approach to Kabul was left virtually undefended by Afghan troops. Brown was able to reach Dhaka with relative ease, and spent the winter camped safely in Jalalabad. Eight of the native troops fighting with the British were awarded the Indian Order of Merit. After the battle, Shah Ali still refused to ask the Russians for military assistance, despite their insistence that he should seek terms of surrender from the British. With British forces occupying much of the country, Shah Ali's son and successor, Muhammad Yaqub Khan, signed the Treaty of Gandamak in May 1879 to prevent a British invasion of the rest of the country. According to this agreement and in return for an annual subsidy and vague assurances of assistance in case of foreign aggression, Yaq relinquished control of Afghan foreign affairs to Britain. British representatives were installed in Kabul and other locations, British control was extended to the Khyber and Maishni passes, and Afghanistan ceded various frontier areas and quetta to Britain. The British army then withdrew. However, on 3 September 1879 an uprising in Kabul led to the slaughter of Sir Pierre Kavagnari his guards and staff, provoking the next phase of the Second Afghan War. A force was assembled and named, the Kabul Field Force, under the command of Major General Frederick Roberts. After defeating Afghan forces at Shriazab on 6 October, Roberts marched into Kabul on 13 October. At the end of November, an army under the command of Muhammad Jam, who had denounced Yaq Khan as a British puppet and instead declared Musa Jam, the new Emir, gathered in the area north of Kabul. On 11 December a small detachment, 170 men, of the 9th Queen's Royal Lancers and the 14th Bengal Lancers encountered a 10,000-plus Afghan army advancing on Kabul. As it was of the utmost importance that Muhammad Jan's advance was delayed, the woefully outnumbered lancers charged the Afghans. Heavy casualties were suffered and the Afghans continued their advance. But on December 15th, the Afghan army began to besiege the British forces entrenched in the Sherpa cantonment. As news of a relief column under the command of Brigadier General Charles Goff reached Mohammed Jam, he ordered his troops to storm the cantonment on 23 December. By midday, 
the assault had been repulsed, and the Afghan army dispersed. No quarter was given to Afghans found in the area with weapons. Yaik Khan, suspected of complicity in the massacre of Kavagnari and his staff, was obliged to abdicate. The British considered a number of possible political settlements, including partitioning Afghanistan between multiple rulers or placing Yaik's brother Ayub Khan on the throne. but ultimately decided to install his cousin Abdur Rahman Khan as Emir instead. The Battle of Maiwand in 1880 was one of the principal battles of the Second Anglo-Afghan War. In May 1880, a new British Liberal government recalled the Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton from India and replaced him with Lord Ripon who had instructions to bring all troops out of Afghanistan. These plans for the evacuation were disrupted by Ayub Khan. Ayub Khan, Shia Ali's younger son, who had been holding Herat during the British operations at Kabul and Kandahar, set out towards Kandahar with a small army in June 1880, and a brigade under Brigadier General Burroughs was detached from Kandahar to oppose him. Burroughs' brigade, some 2,500 strong with about 500 British troops including a battery of 9 PR, advanced to Helmand, opposite Grishk, to oppose Ayub Khan, but was there deserted by the levies of Shia Ali, the British appointed Wali of Kandahar. The levies were defeated and four smoothbore 6 PR guns and two smoothbore 12 PR howitzers captured. Burroughs fell back to a position at Gushkinakhud, halfway to Kandahar where he could intercept Ayub Khan if he headed for either Ghazni or Kandahar. He remained there a week during which time the captured guns were added to his force with E battery and additional gunners drawn from the British infantry. On the afternoon of the 26th July, information was received that the Afghan force was making for the Maiwand Pass a few miles away. Burroughs decided to move early the following day to break up the Afghan advance guard. At about 10 a.m. horsemen were seen and engaged, and the brigade started to deploy for battle. Burroughs was not aware that it was Ayub's main force. The Afghans, who numbered 25,000 including Afghan regular troops and five batteries of artillery including some very modern Armstrong guns. The Afghan guns gradually came into action and a three-hour artillery duel ensured at an opening range of about 1,700 yards, during which the British captured smoothbore guns on the left expended their ammunition and withdrew to replenish it. This enabled the Afghans to force the left-hand battalion back. The left flank comprising Indian infantry regiments gave way and rolled in a great wave to the right. The 66th Regiment, the backbone of defense, was swept away by the pressure of the Ghazi attack. B Battery, Captain Slade, and a half company of Bombay sappers under Lieutenant T. R. Hen, Royal Engineers, stood fast, covering the retreat of the entire British Brigade. B Battery kept firing until the last moment, two sections, four guns, limbering up when the Afghans were 15 yards away, but the third section, Lieutenant McLean, was overrun. McLean was captured and held as a prisoner in Kandahar, where his body was found at Ayub Khan's tent during the British attack on 1 September, apparently murdered to prevent his liberation. The British guns captured during the action were also recovered at Kandahar. B battery came into action again some 400 yards back. Bombay sappers retreated as the guns withdrew.
Penn and 14 of his men afterwards joined some remnants of the 66th Foot and Bombay Grenadiers in a small enclosure at a garden in a place called Gig where a determined last stand was made. Though the Afghans shot them down one by one, they fired steadily until only 11 of their number were left, and the survivors then charged out into the masses of the enemy and perished. Penn was the only officer in that band and he led the final charge. Malalayana is credited with inspiring the Afghans to victory. Malalai's father, who was a shepherd, and her fiancé joined with Ayub Khan's army in a large attack on the British Indian forces in July 1880. Like many Afghan women, Malalai was there to help tend to the wounded and provide water and spare weapons. According to local sources, this was also supposed to be her wedding day. When the Afghan army was losing morale, despite their superior numbers, Malalai took the Afghan flag and shouted, Young love, if you do not fall in the battle of my wand, by God, someone is saving you as a symbol of shame. This inspired the Afghan fighters to redouble their efforts. When a leading flag bearer was killed, Malalai went forward and held up the flag, some versions say she used her veil as a flag, singing a landai. With a drop of my sweetheart's blood, shed in defense of the motherland, will I put a beauty spot on my forehead, such as would put to shame the rose in the garden. But then Malalai was herself struck down and killed. However, her words had spurred on her countrymen to victory. After the battle, Malalai was honored for her efforts and buried in her native village of Kig, where her grave remains today. She was between 17 and 19 at her death. The British were rooted but managed a withdrawal due to their own efforts and the apathy of the Afghans. Of the 2,476 British troops engaged, the British and Indian force lost 21 officers and 948 soldiers killed, and 8 officers and 169 men were wounded, the Grenadiers lost 64% of their strength and the 66th lost 62% including 12 officers, of those present, two companies being detached, the cavalry losses were much smaller. One estimate of Afghan casualties is 3,000, reflecting the desperate nature of much of the fighting, although other sources give 1,500 Afghans and up to 4,000 Ghazis killed. The Battle of Kandahar, the 1st of September 1880, was the last major conflict of the Second Anglo-Afghan War. After the disastrous defeat at Maiwand, the remnants of General Burroughs' battle-wearied army began the 45-mile retreat to the city of Kandahar. Armed local irregulars, exhaustion and thirst contributed to the breakdown of the column's discipline, and were it not for Captain Slade's rearguard action, 
far fewer would have made it to the refuge of the city. All over the wide expanse of desert are to be seen men in twos and threes retreating. Camels have thrown their loads, sick men, almost naked, are astride donkeys, mules and camels. The bearers have thrown down their holies, palanquins, and left the wounded to their fate. The guns and carriages are crowded with the helpless wounded suffering the tortures of the damned. Horses are limping along with ugly ones and men are pressing eagerly to the rear in the hope of finding water. Hordes of irregular horsemen to be seen amongst our baggage animals, relentlessly cutting our men down and looting. A few alone remain with brigadier burrows to try to turn the route into an orderly retreat. Captain Slade. Of the approximately 1,500 British and Indian troops at Maiwand, a little over 960 succumbed in either the battle or the ensuing retreat. Only 161 of the wounded reached the citadel of Kandahar. The remnants of the straggling column reached Kandahar on the 28th raising the garrison numbers to 4,360. The Afghan population of 12,000 were compelled to leave. With the abandonment of the cantonments, the whole garrison withdrew behind the walls of the fortified city and organized preparations for its defense. These defenses included improving and facilitating communications along the city's walls, plugging breaches, constructing gun platforms and the laying of wire obstacles outside the walls to entangle their foe. The Afghans determined to harass and hinder the defenders' preparations throughout. On 8 August, Ayyub Khan, the victor at Maiwand, opened fire on the citadel from Piggy Hill northwest of the city. A few days later other guns volleyed forth from the villages of Dekoa and Dekati on the east and south. An attempt to neutralize the village of Dekoa, led by Brigadier General Brook on the 16th, proved unsuccessful. During the extrication, both Brigadier General Brook and Captain Cruikshank fell, adding to the casualty total of over 100. The Maiwan disaster had altered military plans for the evacuation of the Kabul garrison from Afghanistan. The present question is the relief of Kandahar and the defeat of Ayub. I have a fine force ready for the work, and Bob's would go in command of it. General Donald Stewart, Kabul. The Bob's in question, General Roberts, would personally lead a division from Kabul to rectify the recent calamity and relieve the besieged city of Kandahar. It was also arranged that General Thayer would march from Quetta in northern India with the same intention, and that General Stewart would proceed to evacuate the rest of the garrison back to India as originally planned. The Viceroy of Afghanistan was informed that Roberts would march on the 8 August with the expectation of reaching Kandahar by 2 September. Of the 10,000 men under Roberts' command, a little over 2,800 were Europeans. Because of the unforgiving terrain of the Afghan country, and the necessity of speed, all troops were ordered to travel light, 20 to 30 pounds of kit per trooper, and controversially, no wheeled transport or artillery taken. 8,500 mules, donkeys and ponies would be utilized to carry the main supplies. The march from Kabul to Kandahar is approximately 320 miles, Although the chosen route through the Logger Valley was not the shortest, the valley's fertile land would supplement their supplies.
the army paid for everything they took throughout the march including grain, fresh animals and even firewood, the local Afghans were more than pleased to barter with the troops. The stop at Ghazni proved to be brief, the column set off again very early in the cool of the morning of the 16th. By the end of the day's march in the early afternoon, the temperatures had exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit with very little shade, sore feet and the constant scarcity of water adding to the extreme discomfort. The method of such marching as was now put in practice is not easy to describe. It combined the extreme of freedom in movement with carefully regulated halts. And the closest control in every portion of the column, it employed the individual intelligence of each man composing the masses in motion, and called on all for exertion in overcoming the difficulties of the march, in bearing its extraordinary toil, and in aiding the accomplishment of the object in view. General Chapman By the 24th, the relief column had reached Kilatai Gilzai. General Roberts received a letter from General Primrose at Kandahar describing the sortie in the village of Deco earlier on the 16th, and informing Roberts of the situation. On the 25th, the relief column, joined now by the garrison of Kilatai Gilzai, resumed their march towards Kandahar. General Fayer's relief column however had suffered many problems from his arduous trek and was still some distance from Kandahar. The following day Robert's relief force reached Turandas. It was here that Roberts learned that Ayub Khan had lifted the siege of Kandahar and had retired north to the village of Mzra in the Urgandab Valley. On the 27th General Hugoff proceeded to Robat with two cavalry regiments whilst the remainder of the force, moving somewhat slower, joined them in Robat on the 28th. It was now only 19 miles to Kandahar. The long march from Kabul to Kandahar, of the entire column of men, followers and baggage took 20 days, an average of just over 15 miles a day. The followers alone included nearly 2,200 dually bearers, 4,700 transport men and over 1,200 servants. Although the march was unhindered by the Afghans, it was an historic and remarkable feat of human endurance and organization. On the morning of the, the 31st of August 1880, the relief force reached Kandahar. However, for the last part of the trek, General Roberts, struck down with fever, had to be carried in a dually, though for dignity's sake, the general had forced himself upon a horse when within sight of the city. A rugged and precipitous spur, separates the Arkham Dab Valley from the Kandahar Plain. Both valley and plain are linked via the Mercha Pass at the end of the spur, and the Babawali Pass cutting through it. The section of the spur from Babawali Pass to its tip, is known as the Purpimal Hill. Behind this spur lies the village of Mzra, around which Ayub Khan had camped. As well as the spur, the Afghans had other geographic advantages. Directly behind Purpimal Hill lies the Karoti Hill, both of which providing excellent firing positions, and, between the hills, deep irrigation channels offered excellent defensive cover. A reconnaissance of the area on the afternoon of the 31st, carried out by General Goff and Colonel Chapman, garnered valuable information of these Afghan positions. However, their retirement from the reconnaissance came under concerted attack from Afghan regulars and irregulars. 
the Sikh infantry were so hard pressed that elements of the 1st and 3rd brigades were ordered into the action. Armed with this hard won military intelligence, Roberts decided to attack the following day, the morning of the 1st of September 1880. While the Babawali Pass would be bombarded by artillery, 1st and 2nd Infantry Brigades, 3rd in reserve, would attack the enemy between the Purpimal and Karoti Hills and push up the Ergon Dab Valley towards Ayub Khan's main camp at Msra. The Mercha and Babawali passes were to be covered by cavalry elements supported by General Primrose's infantry and artillery. Goff's cavalry would move across the Ergen Dam, so as to reach by a wide circuit the anticipated line of the Afghan retreat. A little after 9 a.m., the artillery to the right of Picky Hill began its bombardment of the Babawali Pass. The Afghans replied with a three-field gun battery. However, before Roberts could push his army forward, Afghan positions in the villages of Gundi Musahibdad, on the British right, and Gundigan, on the British left, had to be cleared. Gandhi Musahibdad was hard fought. General McPherson advancing his 92nd Highlanders and 2nd Gurkhas met determined resistance to the attack that included a bayonet charge by the Highlanders. Both sides suffered casualties, but the Afghans came off far worse, possibly losing up to 200 men. After the village had been pacified, the brigade pushed towards the southwesterly point of Purpimo, constantly harassed by determined Afghan resistance. Whilst General McPherson advanced against Gundi Musahibdad, General Baker moved against Gundigan, the 72nd Highlanders and the 2nd Sikh infantry in the van. Again the fighting was hard fought, the Afghans holding well defended positions that only a concerted effort by the attackers could dislodge. However, the left wing of the 72nd, supported by 5th Gurkhas, finally took the village, whilst the right wing supported the Sikhs, battling through the orchards between the two villages. As General Baker's brigade moved forward into the open it came under artillery fire from the extremity of the Purpimal Hill and massed attacks from Ghazis, the latter resolutely repelled by the Highlanders and Sikhs. The two brigades could now together move forward. McPherson's brigade moved close around the spur to take the village of Purpimal. Having passed the village, the 92nd Highlanders under command of Major White met with determined resistance southwest of the Babalwadi Pass.
despite reinforcements from Mayop Khan's main camp at Mutha, McPherson stormed the position. Major White's Highlanders in the van supported by the 5th Gurkhas and 23rd Pioneers. Again a determined resistance and steady fire from the Afghans, many of whom firing from the slopes of the Purpimal Hill, caused many Highlander casualties, but despite heavy losses, the British dispersed some 8,000 Afghans at Bayonet Point. While McPherson's brigade advanced close under the ridge, Baker's troops swept wider on the left, Colonel Money having been assigned to take possession of the Kalwoti Hill. From the northern end of the hill, Colonel Mummy could see Ayop Khan abandon his camp at Kuzra in the face of the advancing forces of McPherson and Baker. Roberts had by now ordered McGregor's 3rd Brigade to Perpimal village to where he himself and General Ross, commander of the whole infantry division, were to move. Here, General Ross, unable to discern the situation, ordered the forward brigades to halt and replenish their spent ammunition. However, this delay provided Ayub Khan some respite. When the British finally entered the camp at 1 p.m., it was deserted, save for the smartly abandoned detritus of an army in retreat. Ayub Khan's army was now in full rout. Although the plan for General Goff's cavalry to intercept the retreating Afghans did not work in practice, it was clear the British had achieved a decisive victory. The Battle of Kandahar brought a close to the Second Anglo-Afghan War. Ayub Khan had been decisively beaten. He had lost the whole of his artillery, his camp, enormous quantities of ammunition, and about 1,000 men killed. Ayub Khan became a fugitive along with the small remnants of his battered army. The British appointee, Abd al Rahman, was thus securely established as Emir of Afghanistan under a protectorate which gave Britain control of Afghanistan's foreign policy, while the British government of India retained the frontier territories ceded by the Treaty of Gandamak. Having achieved the aims of their invasion of Afghanistan, the British withdrew. Ayub Khan subsequently raised a fresh rebellion against Abd ur Rahman, but was swiftly defeated and killed ending the threat to the new regime. This political settlement was to endure until the Third Anglo-Afghan War in 1919. Roberts left Kandahar on 9 September and marched to Quetta with part of his division. On the 15 October, at CB, he resigned his command, and sailed from Bombay on the 30th taking sick leave in England. The exploits of General Roberts in Afghanistan greatly boosted his reputation as a skillful and enterprising soldier. Many years later, Roberts' heroic march was commemorated by a statue in Glasgow's Kelvin Grove Park upon which the motto, Virtue Tet Valor, by Virtue and Courage is inscribed. In popular culture, Sherlock Holmes' friend, and story narrator, Dr. Watson briefly served in the Second Afghan War, as described in the first chapter of, A Study in Scarlet. In subsequent books, occasional reference is made to the wound Watson suffered from a Jazale bullet, although Conan Doyle was notoriously poor at remembering whether the wound was in his shoulder, or leg.
the Second Anglo-Afghan War, by Wikipedia, was made possible in part by Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Windows Live Movie Maker, Movie Making Magic. Ivona Recordings, let the world hear what you really have to say. Soundogs.com, downloadable sound effects since 1997. Subtitle Edit, version 3.1, free subtitle editor with visual sync time adjustments.